Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. We pray this message inspires you, builds your faith, and shows you how much God truly loves you. If you're ever in the Bartlesville area, we would love to meet you. For more information, visit our website at citychurchok.com. Let's jump into the message. We hope you enjoy. What's going on, City Church? How y'all doing today? Good. Good to see you guys. My name's Sam McCullough. I'm one of the team pastors here, and I'm excited to share with you today as we wrap up our series, Freedom. Have y'all been enjoying this series? Half of y'all have. Yeah. Um, It's been good. It's been really good, honestly. I've I've really enjoyed it. Uh, No, it's been a great series, and I'm excited to close it out, and I'm just going to shoot you straight here. Uh, If you came to church today going, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, I'm sure the message is going to be really lighthearted and just kind of relax through this service, and, you know, God's not really going to get up in my business today. That's false. Um, it's going to be a little intense, and we're going we're gonna to kind of go there today, and uh, here's why. Because Christ paid way much for our freedom for us to not stay free, and I'm excited to share with you today. I'm excited to close this, and here, here's what I believe uh, with everything in me. I don't, I don't say this lightly, and it happened last service. Um, God's going to move today in hearts, and there's some of you here today that have been carrying something for far too long, and I want to encourage you, Jesus carried it on the cross so that you don't have to. And today, there are going to be people in here, and I I just believe that the expectation is here even now. And maybe you're not into church, maybe you're not into God and this whole Jesus thing. Here's the good thing. He's into you, and he loves you. And I believe this, that God is going to do something significant in our hearts today. Are you guys open to that today? That's awesome. Well, we're going to read a story that's very obscure. Uh, it's, It's from the Bible, which is that's a good start. Um, it's really a weird story, and it's actually about Noah. And many of you, if you even if you didn't grow up in church, honestly, you've probably heard like Noah and the ark story, you know? No, just me? Okay. So there's a guy named Noah. Earth got really bad. This is the beginning in Genesis. Earth got really bad. Like, it was really bad. Bad enough to where God was like, man, I regret making the human race in its entirety. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a flood. We're going to wipe out all of humanity. Pretty intense. I know. Read it. So sends in a flood and and saves animals and one family, okay? One family that kind of remained righteous, that God was like, I regret making all humans, but we're going to start from scratch with these guys right here. It was Noah and his family. So the flood did happen. It came. It was really bad. Everybody died. Sorry. But it was intense, And then this story picks up immediately after the floodwaters recede, literally the next chapter. I don't know how many days it was. I'm sure somebody else does. But here's what happens. And and, and you're, you're not going to find this story in an illustrated children's Bible. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Actually, you'll find out pretty quick in about 38 seconds. So Genesis chapter 9, verse 20, says this. After the flood, everybody say, after the flood. flood. So after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground, and he planted a vineyard. That sounds nice. That's innocent. One day, drank some wine that he had made, and he became drunk and lay naked inside of his tent. Man, things go from like, earth just got rescued, God is so good, to, you know what, I'm going to plant some grapes, and I'm fixing to get crunk. So Noah... (laughs) just gets drunk, and not just like a little saucy, you know, not just like, I'm going to just, you know, sling back one, maybe two if we're feeling risky. No, no. He gets so drunk that the dude is naked in his tent. Now, some of y'all have a past, some don't, but y'all could probably level with me that that dude got drunk. Like, (laughs) y'all, some of you are offended right now that I'm talking about this. Get over it. I'm just reading the Bible, okay? He's so drunk that he's laying naked in his tent. Like, that is drunk. Okay, so then things go from bad to worse. It says this in verse 22. It says, Ham, little Thanksgiving throwback, the father of Canaan saw that his father was naked and went outside and told his brothers. Now, I don't care how old Ham was. Y'all know that's something as a son that you can't never unsee. You walk in the room and you're like, dear God. What is wrong with you, daddy? And then here's where it gets bad. So he saw that his father was, <laughs> y'all never going to see Noah the same after this. <laughs> then it says this, he went outside and he told his brothers. Now he wasn't just like, 
Y'all might want to check on dad. He's drunk and naked in a tent again. No, he went out there and was like, hey, pff, daddy's drunk and naked and in a tent. If it was today's world, they'd be putting that on like Instagram live and be like, man, check this out. He's crazy. Look at him. It's our own grapes too. <laughs> it says, then Shem and Japheth took a row and held it over their shoulders and backed into the tent to cover their father. So they already know. They're like, here's the thing. Ham really shames his father. Because if you know anything about Middle Eastern culture, they don't even like to show off their shins, much less be found drunk, naked, and in a tent. And he goes out and he blasts it to the whole hood. He's like, Dad, he's drunk and naked and in a tent. The other brothers do the smart thing. They get a robe, and they're like, man, I ain't trying to see that. Like, they easing up in there. You don't want to see your dad drunk, naked. They, they you know, kind of open that little tent up just a little bit, and they say, all right, let's just squeeze on in here. And you take that corner and... I don't know, hope to God that landed. Oh, okay, it's on them. And they backed back out. So they did the smart thing. Back in the tent, they covered their father. And it says, as they did this, they looked the other way, way so they wouldn't see him naked. This story just cracks me up. I don't know if it's just like the seventh grader in me coming out. Some of you middle schoolers are like, this church is awesome. <laughs> Mom, I'll come to church every weekend. And then it says in verse 24, when Noah woke up from his stupor, a.k.a. when he woke up, hung over and ticked at the world, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. Then he cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. This story blows my mind. God has just rescued the entire human race for living like trash, okay? Literally said, Noah, you and your family are the only righteous ones. I am counting on you to reboot this whole thing. You all go out there, grow some plants, and do a good job. And Noah's like, you bet your bottom dollar, God. I'm going to grow some plants, and I'm going to get drunk, naked, and in a tent, and then I'm going to curse my own family. How quickly do these things spiral out of control? Now, as you sit here in your comfy seat, whether it's the green one, the brown chair, whatever you're in, you're going, what does this story have to do with me? Today, we're sharing about breaking cycles of sin in our lives. Breaking cycles of sin in our lives. I want to rewind to March 2003, Monterey, Mexico. I was on my first mission trip, and God did an amazing work in my heart. I went from questioning God, really wondering if he was real or not, growing up in a Christian home, but not living for God, seeing God do amazing things, kind of like Noah, on a much smaller scale, but big in my heart. And the last night of that trip, our youth leader had these stakes, and maybe if you grew up in church or youth group, it's really not that complicated, you'll remember this. He had these little stakes, and he said, hey, if God did something in your life, I want you to, I want you to write it down on that stake, whatever that sin, that kind of hang up that you have in your life, I want you to write it down, and I want you to date it as kind of a symbol for what God did in your life, and I want you to kind of stake it, spiritually speaking, that you're never going back to this again. So I was in ninth grade. I'm like crying. You know, the worship leader was playing some great worship music. I was feeling the moment. And I was serious in my heart, and I wrote these things down, and I meant it with everything in me. God, I will never, ever go back to that again. I right, fast forward to the very next day whenever I got home, and I done went and did the exact things I said I would never, ever do again. Now, I'd venture to say that there are people in this room that during this series, you wrote down things on those little white flags. The message was powerful. God was doing something in your heart, and you said, man, this is it. I'm done. I'm staking it in front of the cross, and I'm never going back again. I would also venture to say that there are some of us that the minute we left the parking lot, we went and did the very thing that we said we would never do again. God, I'll never do blank again. But we find ourselves caught up in these cycles of sin that we keep going back to. 
See, it's not just about the big noticeable sins that everybody sees, but it's also those things that are going on on the inside. It's those thought patterns, those insecurities, that pride, that anger, that jealousy, that comparison trap that we find ourselves in. Either way, here's the truth. Proverbs 26, 11 says this, as a dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. Now I'm gonna go ahead and raise my hand. Has anybody ever caught up in a cycle in their life before that you say, I will never do it again, but we find ourselves doing it again. We're going to dive into that today. Key scripture is Galatians 5.1. It's been our scripture for the series. It says, so Christ has truly set us free. Christ has truly set us free. Now listen to this part. It's crucial. And this is what we're focusing on. Now, make sure that you, everybody say me. me. Come on, say it like you mean, say me. Make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law. See, we're going to make sure that we focus on something. It's great. The Bible says that Christ has set you free. And a lot of us, like, we love to amen that part. That's good. That's fire right there. Like, Christ has set us free. Amen. I will preach to that. I will worship to that. But the second sentence is what we need to latch on to right now. Yes, Christ has set you free, but notice how it shifts to you and says, now you make sure that you stay free. Listen to that. Christ has set you free, but you make sure that you stay free. I'm going to say it again. Christ, yes, when he came and he died on the cross and he rose again from the grave, come on, he set you free. Thank God for that. But then listen, it says, it. now you make sure that you stay free. God wiped the slate clean for Noah and his family and the entire race, but where we missed it is that we didn't stay free. We're going to talk about breaking cycles of sin in our life, but here's the issue. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that we don't see sin for what it is. You see, sin at its very root is separation from God. Sin is death. If you boil it down, it is death. It is separation from God. It's death to your relationships. Come on, it's death to your future. It's death to your marriage. Sin is a cancerous cell that wants to take over every part of your life and take you out. And see, we don't see sin for what it is. And if we want to have real change in our life, then we've got to see it for what it is. Call it for what it is. You see, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. These are called cycles. My prayer is that we would see these sin cycles break in our lives. And I'm going to walk you through a few different steps. And this isn't the end all, but I believe this. It'll be a start and a catalyst for some people today if you want it and if you're ready. Are you all ready to break some cycles in your lives today? I want you to write this down. This is the first one. I will break the cycle. I will break the cycle when I take responsibility. When I take responsibility. If you want to break cycles in your life, friend, you have to take responsibility. I have a five-year-old daughter. Her name is, Ch- is Charlie, and she has a 10-month-old brother. His name's Bennett. Charlie loves having a little brother. Like, she loves it. She's a great sister. She's really good at it. But I've also discovered another reason why Charlie loves to have a little brother. Now she has somebody else that she can blame her messes on. I'll give you an example. She leaves crayons out everywhere. I I didn't know crayons could end up in the places that they end up in our house, but she leaves them out everywhere, and Bennett loves to chew on those crayons. Yeah. But I'll come up to her, and I'll be like, Charlie Kate, I told you to put those crayons away. And this is what she said. She'll look at me in the face, and she'll go, whoa, well, Bubba, well, Bubba touched them, so he's playing with them too. And I'm like, well, Bubba's 10 months old, and he puts everything in his mouth that he sees and doesn't even know what he's doing. And she's like, what? And I'm like, ah, no more W word in this house. And what we're teaching Charlie is that she has to take responsibility for the choices that she's made. And she can't actually have any change in her life until she finally takes responsibility for decisions that she's made. And she's actually starting to pick it up and learn. And you know, the truth is, it's the same for us. It might sting to have to own it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There's that issue. Some of y'all already been thinking about what it is when I started preaching. There's that issue. And what stings is when you own that you did it. But the only way to change is when you admit that you did the deed. That's it. 
Like if you want to change, you've got to be willing to admit, I did that. It's easier to blame others for the issues that we have. Come on, y'all. Let's be real. It's a lot easier to blame others for the things that we are doing. Isn't that funny? Just think about the logic of that thought. There isn't any. We love to blame others. And the quicker that you can say, I did that. This is difficult. I did that. I made that choice to lie. I made that choice to take X too far. I did that. I committed that sin. And the quicker you are to seeing real and lasting change in your life. But friends, if you want to break cycles, you got to take responsibility. We have to take responsibility. Romans 7, 19 through 21, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. He is like the forerunner of our faith, written over two-thirds of the New Testament. This dude is like a Christian, like he's good, like he's a solid guy. And he says this, I want to do what is good, but I don't. Y'all ever felt that way before? I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Come on, I, I, I can relate to that so much. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is a sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this, this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. Friends, I just want to pause here and encourage somebody today. As we're getting kind of intense and getting in each other's business, know this. You need to hear it. You're not alone. You're not alone. Come on, you're struggling with some cycle, some sin. I'm telling you right now, I guarantee you, there's a handful of other people dealing with the same thing you're dealing with right now. And maybe it might not be the same action, but I'll tell you, it's the same root. Right? Come on. We're all in this boat together. And I thank God I've got people like Paul going, listen, I've screwed up. But you've got to, what is he doing? He's taking responsibility. Friends, I'm going to ask you a real intense question. Are you willing to take responsibility for that issue today? If we say we want to change, are we willing to see sin for what it is and take responsibility? Come on, are we willing to stop blaming it for some, on somebody that might not even be in our lives anymore? Some of us are, are blaming our issues on somebody that isn't even in our lives anymore. And don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying what's happened to you, friends. I could tell you plenty of stories about my life. I'm not downplaying what's happened, but here's what I'm saying. Okay, today is today. Let's take some responsibility. Come on, yesterday happened. Come on, are we willing to take responsibility? We've already seen what not taking responsibility will do. So will we take responsibility? Come on, will we not blame it on where we grew up, what side of town we grew up in? Will we not blame it on our spouse? Will we not blame it on our kids? Will we not blame it on X, Y, and Z anymore and take responsibility? Because I'll tell you this, the minute you take responsibility for your issue, you become dangerously close to living out a free life that Christ paid for for you but you got to take responsibility. Hey, the second one, I want you to write this down. Once you're willing to take responsibility, this is huge. You've got to eliminate opportunities. Eliminate opportunities. Colossians 3, 5 says this, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Church, I'm going to say it plainly. If there's something in your life, a cycle that's holding you back, that you keep going back to, it is time to cut it out of your life. Like, it can't be in your life and not mess you up. It's time to cut it out. What am I talking about? If there's an app that you keep going to on your phone and you sin when you get on that app and you know what I'm talking about. It could be a number of different things. Delete the app, change your password, and give that password to somebody you trust. What? Man, if you struggle with alcoholism, you probably shouldn't go chill with your friend at the bar and then wonder, man, why am I drunk again today? If you struggle with gambling, I hate to break it to you, Seafood Fridays is probably off the table now. I'm laughing because you know what I'm talking about. It's that just don't even go there. Man, that's a little extreme, don't you think, Pastor Sam? Yeah, so are the consequences of sin in your life. So are the consequences of your marriage falling apart. So are the consequences of you not living out the calling that God had for you. As I said it from the beginning. He paid too high a price for his sons and daughters to be free, for us not to live free. 
It's not just about you anymore. It's about the people attached to your life. Nothing's ever just about you. That's a whole other message at a different time, but we've got to eliminate opportunities. We can't wonder why we keep falling into these cycles whenever we leave them right at our door. Are you willing to eliminate opportunities? Romans 13, 14 says, but ask the Lord Jesus Christ to help you live as you should and don't make plans to enjoy evil. I always say this, there's a reason verses are in the Bible. There's a reason that that was written for us. Don't make plans to enjoy evil. Let me me put it a different way. Choosing not to make plans to eliminate opportunities is us making plans to enjoy evil. You have to have a plan. You've got to eliminate those things. Church, there's a reason I don't sleep with a sleeve of Oreos next to my nightstand because it won't be there in the morning. (laughs) Why am I getting fat? I'll tell you exactly why. Because I got those double stuffed Oreos next to my bed. What? Jeez. Eliminate opportunities and you'll start to break cycles in your life. Hey, next, this is, this is crucial. The next step right here in breaking cycles is we have to anticipate attacks. Again, see this for what it is. It's so much deeper than what's right in front of your face. You've got to anticipate attacks. And what am I talking about? 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert and watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Church, make no mistake. There is an enemy. His name is Satan. And his sole purpose is to wipe out your life. His purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And I want to tell you something else. He doesn't play fair. He doesn't, he doesn't look at the Thompsons and go, well, the Thompsons, and then they're not struggling, but I'm using it as an example. The Thompsons are having kind of a rough go in life, so I'm just going to take it easy on them. After all, I'm Satan. No! When you're having a rough time and you're already down in the dirt is when he steps in and stomps on you again. And then when you think you're getting back up and everything's okay, he does it all over again. He doesn't play fair. He doesn't care how you're feeling. He's a stealer, a killer, a destroyer. We've got to quit wondering why these things keep happening when we're not learning to anticipate the things that are going to come. He knows what he's doing. The enemy, again, the, the illustration of a lion kind of toughens him up too much for me because if you know about lions and how they hunt, they don't go after the strong. Lions go after something that's limping, that's already been weakened, that's off on their own, that's already struggling. Church, you've got to learn to anticipate the attacks of the enemies. And see, the enemy knows your triggers. Come on, he knows when you're had a, you had a long day at work. Come on, he knows when you hung, you hangry. Y'all get hangry every now. Some of you hangry right now. You're fixing to get in a fight with your spouse if you don't get a hold of this right now. You're hangry. You're, you're mad because somebody ate all the stuffing. It's like eight days old now, bro. Move on. But he knows your triggers. He knows that whenever you're in this place in your soul that he can sneak in and make you do things you never would have dreamed that you could do. And then he says, I got him in the cycle again. He knows your triggers. you got to know your enemy. I want to nerd out for you, nerd out with you for just a second. But first, let me share this with you. Ephesians 6.12, this is huge. It says this, We're not waging war against enemies of the flesh and blood alone. No, this fight is against tyrants, against authorities, against supernatural powers of demon princes that slither in the, darkest, in the darkness of this world and against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. You know, that's intense. That is like nightmare stuff right there. He's, he's, he, we're illustrating that there's so much more going on than what you can actually see. There's a fight for your soul. There's a fight to get you caught up in cycles. And what we're saying today is learn to anticipate. There's a term. I said I was going to nerd out on you for a second. It's a Japanese term, and it's yomi. Yomi. And it's a term that means knowing the mind of your opponent. Knowing the mind of your opponent. Church, learn what are the tactics and the schemes that the enemy has used against you that have worked so well and learn to anticipate them. Because if you know, y'all ever play Street Fighter and you've got that friend that just does the same move over and over again, and you're like, I, I hate you. You're the worst friend. Or they keep, y'all, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. 
I just dated myself right there. Some of you old people know what I'm talking about. They do the same move over and over again. It's annoying, and you keep walking into it like, why are they beating me? Because you're not learning to anticipate what they're doing. Come on, you keep getting hit by the same thing. You go, well, why do I keep doing it? Church, learn. Learn to anticipate and know your opponent. You've got to know him. And as we close up, I want to share something finally. This is it. This is the last step. This is what breaks cycles ultimately. If you want to break cycles, you've got to fully commit. I'm talking fully commit. Yes, of course, first and foremost, you've got to fully commit to God Almighty, but you've got to fully commit to be willing to break cycles in your life. You can't kind of break things. You get what I'm saying? Sometimes we kind of try to live for Jesus and we go, why are changes not happening in my life? You don't go to a doctor with a broken arm and he goes, well, I think that thing might be kind of broken, Bob. It's either broken or it's not. Come on, cycles either get broken or they don't. And we've got to quit fooling ourselves into thinking that we're fully committed when we're really not. We've got to fully commit. Romans 6.12 says this, that means that you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Let me say that again. That means that you must not even give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it that time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full time into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under the old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. Romans 6, 11, from now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue. Sin speaks a dead language from now on. Are we fully committed? What does it look like? It's simple. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. Following God and being fully committed isn't complicated, but I would be lying if I told you it's easy. I had somebody ask me these questions the other day, and I'm going to ask you. Are, are, are you praying every single day? Every day, are you praying? I'm not talking about when somebody cuts you off and you're like, oh my God. That's not what I'm talking about. Are you praying? Are you leaning in and seeking God? I'm not talking for hours. I'm just talking, are you leaning into God daily? Come on, are you reading your Bible every single day? Again, I'm not, I'm not talking about being like, Super Christian and reading 48 chapters a day. No, just leaning in and feeding on his word just a little bit every single day. Married people, are you praying with your spouse daily? I, I, I wonder if we're spending our lives not living out these basic Christian principles. And then we're wondering, God, why am I caught up in these cycles? Because we've got to be honest with ourselves. We're not fully committed. But I want to ask you the question, kind of the same thought that I've been talking about, how bad do you want to see these cycles broken in your life? He wasn't playing games when he died on the cross for you. It's time for us to stop. I can tell you one thing. God's not playing games, and the enemy's not playing games. Often it's just us that's playing these games. Christ has set us free. Now you make sure that you stay free. Would you close your eyes out of respect for the person next to you? I believe that God is doing something in people's hearts. And here in a minute, I think the Spirit of God is going to do something in your lives that you've never experienced before. You're going to walk in more freedom than you've ever walked in. But it all starts with knowing Christ. Maybe you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus before. You say, Sam, I've never given my life to Christ. Gosh, maybe you're like I was. You've given your life to him, but things just aren't right, and you want to recommit to him. Galatians 2.20 says, My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Church, today could be your day, the beginning of you walking in freedom. If you're here and you say, I want to give my life to Christ, I'm done doing it on my own, or I want to recommit my life to him, I want a fresh start with God today, I'm going to ask you to do something brave. Will you just raise your hand, put it right back down so I can know who I'm praying with? That's awesome. Yeah, not alone. Hands going up everywhere. I want to give my life to Christ, or I want to recommit my life to him. Again, nobody looking around. Just raise your hand, put it right back down. That's amazing. We're going to do something right now. We do it every week. We're going to pray the believer's prayer. And I want you to say this with me, especially if you raise your hand. It's you committing your life to Christ, asking him to take over. And it's the beginning of walking in the freedom that he bought for you. Say, Heavenly Father, I love you. I thank you for loving me. 
so much that you sent Jesus, your son, to die for me. Today, right here, right now, I open my life. I give you my heart, and I call you Lord. Thank you for loving me, for saving me. My life is yours. From this day forward, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate. Thanks again for joining us. We love the small part we get to play in helping you on your journey with God. Email us at info at citychurchok.com if there's anything that we can do to help you with the next step. Also, if you've enjoyed the message, be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Have a great day. Join us again next week.